Good morning. Welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. We are so glad that you're here. We welcome you into the house of God to worship with the people of God. We welcome those of you that are in the parking lot and that are joining us live streaming on Facebook Live from home. It's good to be here. The Board of Realtors asked me to express their, um, their great gratitude at letting them use our facilities. They raised uh, over $1,000 for the homeless shelter with their pancake drive through breakfast. And it worked, they were so pleased with the facilities, both to cook and just the whole parking lot. It worked out really, really well. And it was for a good cause. And so thank you for your generosity of our facilities that they could help our community in that way. Today, when we leave, there will be individually wrapped bags of cookies, and I'm told maybe some candy, that you will get on your way out. In lieu of a cake and punch reception for our graduates, um, we will have the individually wrapped treats. Uh, and if it's not raining, we can, we can visit a little bit better outside. But that will be available to you when you leave today, so that's exciting news. And it's not, it's not delineated specifically, but we will be honoring our graduates during the children's time. So when it is time for young disciples, I do want all the children to come forward. And then I'll, I'm going to have you sit on the pews up here and then have our graduates come up. And you get to have a front row seat as we um, acknowledge their achievement. There are um, little four by six cards on the table where the big floofy flowers are out in the narthex for VBS. Vacation Bible School is going to be the last full week in July, which I have to look at. The, the dates are the July 26th through the 29th, and the theme is treasured. It's a treasure hunt, treasured discovering that you are priceless to God. And so mark your calendars for the last week in July. It's good. It's good to be here in the presence of one another and the presence of the Lord this morning. Welcome. Welcome to worship. Good morning. Um, two, two additional announcements. Next Sunday is the day of Pentecost when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and I have always, uh, dis that's the day I wear my red tie. So I invite you to wear red. Wear red to help us celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's also the day we receive the Pentecost offering when, and there's information in the bulletin about it, an insert plus the offering envelope. The Pentecost offering uh, supports Presbyterian Church ministries with youth and young adults. One of the important ministries with young adults is the uh, 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 Young Adult Volunteer Program, which you can read about in the insert. Uh, quite a few of those who serve a year as a young adult volunteer end up going on to seminary and into the ministry. So this is a way to support leadership development of young people. And, uh, not, and quite a few who be, end up being pastors in the future. So keep that in mind. It also supports the uh, Presbyterian Youth Triennium, which is held every three years. I just learned this week, it was announced that the uh, Triennium next, is next summer, next July. It will not be held at Purdue University because some of the dormitor dormitories there are not uh, air conditioned. Uh, it's first come, first serve on air-conditioned dormitories, but now it's going to be held at the uh, Indiana Convention Center in downtown Indianapolis. So everybody will have air conditioning all the time. So anyway, big change, but uh, it brings together 5,000 young people, and I've, in, in two previous churches, I've sent young people to the Triennium, and it's a life-changing experience. So please give a gift to the Pentecost offering to support those things. Uh, the second thing to mention is that, as you know, uh, this week, Governor uh, DeWine announced on Tuesday that the uh, COVID restrictions will all be lifted on June 2nd, and then the CDC announced that uh, those who are vaccinated no longer need to wear masks in most circumstances. However, just hold on, the session meets a week from tomorrow, and we'll be looking at our protocols 
and considering what alterations to make and, and changes to make in view of, of this new information from the CDC and from Governor DeWine. So please continue to wear your masks and social distance for now, and we will be announcing the changes to the protocols. Uh, it may be that one of the changes we can make is that once you've come into the church and sat down in the pew, you can remove your mask safely. But again, it, it also depends on being vaccinated. So hopefully, if you haven't yet been vaccinated, you will go get your vaccination because they are amazingly safe and effective. And I talked to my epidemiologist friend the other day who was very, very high on the vaccine. So anyway, um, we will be announcing the changes to the protocols after the session meeting a week from tomorrow. So just to share that with you. And now let us worship God, and I, inv I invite those who are able to stand as we join in the responsive call to worship. As we gather together, we remember that we are not alone in our faith. God is our companion. Though the way is not easy and we may suffer in righteousness, God is our comfort. When anger fills our hearts and grief crushes our spirits, God is our counselor. And through it all, we are together, for we are all children of God, our companion, comfort, and counselor. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 108, Christ is Alive. Let us assemble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, casting all our anxiety on the Lord who cares for us. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen.
the God of grace, who calls us to eternal glory in Jesus Christ, will support and strengthen us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us safely share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace be with you all over here. Yeah, go ahead. Come on up. That does anyone else get a little bit of a tear in their eye when they hear that song? Whether it's mine or my older kids, yes, that's a wonderful song. Gentlemen, we are thrilled that you're here today. And it, it, it's an honor to acknowledge this next milestone in your life. Your church family has, um, has known you for many years, all of you. Jacob, since he was a newborn, and so we have watched you grow and change and gotten to know you, and it is delightful and right that we mark these moments in time. Lately, I've been fond of saying to my older sons, you know, your, your current job is not your last job. It's just the next job. And so what I say to you is graduating from high school is not the end of the line. It's the next thing in your life, and you will continue to grow, you will continue to learn, and evolve and become young men, older men, and grow into your life. And so we celebrate with you. I have, in every year I do this, and Matthew, I'm going to use your book to show, okay? Is that all right? I have a book called Welcome to the Big Leagues, Every Man's Journey to Significance. And each of you will be receiving a copy of this book. It was written by a friend of mine, but the message is timeless, and the message is for all of us. Dan uses a baseball analogy, and he tells the story of Daryl Chaney, who was a, a player for the Cincinnati Reds, a pitcher, and how Daryl struggled with believing that he mattered, that he was good enough his whole life, even though he made it to the big leagues. I mean, he played on a World Series championship team. But what he learned through the doubt was that his life matters, and what I say to you is your life matters, not because of what you do, not because of money you make, not because of jobs you have. Your life matters because God says 
it matters. You matter because you are divinely created children of God. He loves you immeasurably. And as much as your families love you, which is limitless, God loves you more. And so as you go into the next phase of your life, know that your family stand behind you, your church family is with you, and God is ever-present. I'd like to pray, and then I'm going to have the blanket bunch come up. Guys, do you hear these words that I'm saying to these boys, these young men? They are words that apply to you just as much. Your life does matter. It doesn't matter how old you are or what grade you are in. You matter because you are also God's children. So I want you to help me as we pray for our graduates, okay? Dear God, thank you for loving us. And thank you for loving Matthew, Cooper, and Jacob. Be with us always as we, as we live our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. All right. All right. So, Matthew, this is for you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Jacob, this is for you. I love you. Congratulations. <laughs> Cooper, this is for you. I love you too. Congratulations. Thank you. And now the Blanket Bunch has a special presentation for our graduates. You know, I don't know why I worried a, a thing about what I should say about this because Sarah covered everything. I could not add one thing to what you said about this, Sarah. This morning, we're especially pleased because Jacob Romer put in an application for the PW scholarship, and we are awarding this to him this morning. His grandmother, Janie Wildoner, will present that to him. And also, we have for each of them a gift. Jacob is going to go to the University of Cincinnati in the fall. He's going to study engineering, and he'll be playing soccer. Matthew Lewis and Cooper Lewis are two of the boys that have been in our church for a long time, and we love these boys. They have been a true inspiration to us, and I follow them on Facebook. I'm not a Facebook person. I don't even know how to respond to anything on Facebook. But when I see the fun that they have with their family and all the things that these boys do, I'm amazed, and I'm just so thrilled for them. And we congratulate them this morning for everything that they've done and want them to know that all three of these boys were so glad that they've been in our church family, and we wish them all the very best in their future. Congratulations, boys. We're very proud of Matthew and Cooper and Jacob and look to great things in the future from all three of you. Thank you very much. Our, <clears throat> our scripture readings today come to us from first from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 15 to 26, and then John chapter 17. I invite you now to hear the word of God as it comes to us from the Acts of the Apostles. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers. Together, the crowd numbered about 120 persons and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, 
which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Thus became known to all the residents of Jerusalem. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their language Hakaldama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his homestead become desolate, and let there be no one to live in it, and let another take his position of overseer. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. And now from Matthew or from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be one, may be with me where I am, to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts and minds now to the truth of your word that its message might reach deep into our souls. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I can't help but imagine that it was a difficult moment for the followers of Jesus of Nazareth. The 11 remaining apostles, the women who had followed Jesus, his mother and his brothers, they were, they'd all gathered together in that upper room, maybe the same room where they had celebrated the Passover with Jesus some 40 or so days earlier. And what were they to do now? They had been through the tragedy of the crucifixion, followed by the unexpected and surprising joy of the resurrection. And over the course of 40 days, the risen Lord had taught them about the kingdom of God. But now he had left them. Acts 1.9 tells us, when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. This event is remembered in the church as the Ascension. This past Thursday was Ascension Day, 40 days after Easter and it also marked a turning point for the disciples. And so as they gathered in that upper room in Jerusalem, they had to be wondering, what now? What now? That's a good question for us here at the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. I've now been with you two and a half months. 
We've had a chance to begin to get to know each other. Um, although I must say I'm still learning names and faces, but please give me some more time and be patient. And we've begun to think about our ministry and our vision of what God is calling us to do and what foundation we will lay for the future. So what now? Where do we go from here? Well, preachers always have to decide what to preach on. You know, that's one, one thing in the Presbyterian tradition that is up to the pastor. <laughs> Now, the pastor can't make any, many other decisions on his or her own, but in the Presbyterian tradition, freedom of the pulpit is a, an important part of our, of our heritage. And so I've been thinking about, over the last few weeks, what to preach on now. And so in terms of preaching, I've decided to spend the next six months or so with you delving into the book of Acts. Well, why Acts? Well, because the circumstances that were faced by the early church are not very much different from the circumstances facing the church of our day. In March, the Gallup poll, you may recall seeing this in the news, the Gallup poll announced that the percentage of Americans who are members of a religious congregation has now dropped below 50%. From a high of 73% in 1947, the percentage of people in our nation who identify as members of a church Synagogue or mosque is now 47%. Gallup cites the nuns, Gen Xers and millennials who are less religious and less inclined toward church membership than their parents and grandparents as the primary cause of this decline. How many of you have children or grandchildren with no church affiliation? I'd say that's rem representative of the way society is now. I have two millennial daughters, and neither of them is a part of a church. But it's not just churches, is it? Over the last 50 years, we've seen a decline in membership in all kinds of organizations, civic, fraternal, and so on. Uh, this was chronicled back in the year 2000 by sociologist Robert Putnam in his landmark book, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community. How many of you remember reading that book? I know I read it. Yeah, Putnam pointed out that the decline in membership was in all kinds of organizations, Kiwanis, Rotary, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, League of Women Voters, labor unions, parent-teacher associations, bowling leagues, and yes, congregations. And so it's not just demographics, and it's not just that the U.S. is a more secular society, it's also that we've become a more individualistic society, we're more tribal. There's less social cohesion. Arguably, we are more divided culturally and politically than any time in the last 160 years. And the other factor that we must not minimize are people who are committed followers of Christ, but who've been deeply wounded by their involvement in congregations. Reba Riley, a writer and, and blogger from Cincinnati, coined the phrase post-traumatic church syndrome to describe persons of faith who have been so wounded by their congregations that they have totally dropped out. Perhaps you know people like this here in Wilmington, or maybe even some of the people you know were, were members of this very congregation. So how are congregation, congregations like ours to cope with being a church in a world like this? What changes do we need to make to reach a world of wounded people and a world that is perhaps mostly indifferent or even hostile to what it is we proclaim and, and believe. Well, I think the book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles, is one of the important biblical resources available to us. Acts is a compilation of stories of the early church, focusing first on Peter and then on Paul, as the good news of Jesus spreads out from Jerusalem and Judea into the, the, the rest of the Roman Empire. But Acts is not just a recitation of the past, it is a guidebook to the future. These stories were handed down to us not just to remind us of what happened way back then, but to shed light on the ways that the church of our day can faithfully respond to its ever-changing circumstances. And so as we see how those early followers of Jesus responded to the changing conditions of their world, perhaps we are better able to respond to the changing conditions of our world. 
Now, I was a biblical studies major in college, and so here's a lesson from Bible 101. How many chapters are there in the book of Acts? This is multiple choice. So A, 8, B, 15, C, 28, or D, God only knows. Well, the correct answer is D, God only knows. But if you answered 28, you still get credit. The book of Acts, as, as handed down to us, has 28 chapters. But the best answer is D, God only knows, because the book of Acts is still being written. You and I are writing a new chapter of it at this very moment. So it will be good for us to spend these upcoming months in the book of Acts as we seek to write our own next chapter. And I invite you in the course of these sermons to read Acts along with me. Send me your questions and comments on the text. And let's discuss how the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington can be an authentic, vibrant, mission-driven, and inclusive congregation in a world of indifference, if not outright hostility. So here in Acts chapter 1, that was a long introduction, by the way, so now we're, we can look at Acts chapter 1. So here we learn two important things about this early group of disciples. First, Luke says they were a unified body of believers. Luke says there were 120 of them, which raises a question, when have you known 120 people to agree on anything? It reminds me of that old adage about Baptists. Get three Baptists together in a room and you'll have five opinions. I've learned that Presbyterians can be equally contentious. Presbyterian history is riddled with conflicts and schisms just as much as Baptist history. Those 120 followers of Jesus were obviously not Baptists. And perhaps they weren't Presbyterian either because Luke says in verse 14, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word together in Greek literally means in the same place or in unity. Today, we might say that they were all on the same page. They were all in in their commitment to each other and to their calling to bring the good news of Jesus to the world. How often does that happen in modern church life? How often do we find a local church that is truly united in the same place as far as serving Christ, on the same page in terms of commitment to being the body of Christ in the community? The churches of our day are better known for their fractiousness than their togetherness. Denominations attract attention when they are in conflict, not when they are in harmony. Is this one of the reasons that the church has not been more effective in reaching the world for Jesus Christ? Think how much a unified body of believers can do, how, how effective our witness can be if we are all on the same page, if we are all in for our mission of being Christ's body in the world. In our gospel lesson today, Jesus prays for the oneness of his followers. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Did you hear the repetition of that in that passage? That they may all be one, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The early Christians were all in for the sake of Christ. They were on the same page. They were united. And if the world is to believe, then the church of our day needs to be all in also. The disciples were united, and then secondly, Luke says they were devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer. They prayed because they were steeped, of course, in the Jewish tradition of prayer, and because they had asked their Lord to teach them how to pray back in, Act, in Luke chapter 11. They prayed because when you come to a crossroads and you don't know what's coming next, Prayer is one of the ways you tap into the rivers of divine compassion, strength, and guidance. Some years ago in Great Britain, the National Lottery inspired so many people to pray that the BBC, in its coverage, 
included what is called the lottery prayer. Now, I had never heard this until I ran across it yesterday. Have you heard of the lottery prayer? It goes like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, but make me a winner. <laughs> the lottery prayer, right? Yeah. Well, it's pretty catchy, but, but guess what? That's not what prayer's about. No. Prayer's about humbling ourselves before God. Prayer's about conforming our will to the purposes of God. Prayer's about opening ourselves up to the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples spent 10 days praying in that upper room. And then they waited for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so what would it mean for our lives if we were to seek that same gift with that same kind of intensity? Do you want to have greater compassion for the needs of others, greater confidence in God's power, greater trust in God's amazing grace? Then spend time in prayer every single day. Pray for your church. Pray for your ruling elders, your deacons, and your trustees. Pray for your pastor and, and your staff. Above all, pray for each other and pray for your community. James 5.16 says, make prayer your common practice. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. I remember an African-American preacher I heard once saying, much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. No prayer, no power. Well, much prayer is what Peter and the other disciples did because they they weren't sure what was going to happen next. Jesus, of course, had given them some clues. He had told them to remain in Jerusalem until they received the gift of the Spirit. But, and so as they waited, we, we, as we've seen, they devoted themselves to prayer. But their first priority was to select a leader to replace Judas. Judas the betrayer. Peter stood up to announce that it was necessary, according to Scripture to appoint an apostle to take Judas's place, whose, by the way, whose tragic end is narrated just a bit too graphically. But there are things in the Bible that aren't always pleasant to read, aren't there? His, uh, Judas's betrayal had resulted in only 11 apostles to carry on the Lord's work. And so Peter is convinced that if the church is to be the new Israel, called forth by Jesus to carry on his mission, then there must be 12 apostles corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. Peter outlines what needs to happen, and then they develop a clear checklist of what this new apostle ought to have going for him. They wanted someone with experience, someone who had been with them during all of the time that Jesus had gone in and out among them, beginning with the baptism of John right up until the day when Jesus was taken up in the, uh, the ascension. They wanted a candidate who remained faithful during those hard times and who really understood the point of following Jesus. This new apostle had to be a faithful servant. He had to know what he was preaching. Peter's words also show that, that they, they had a clear vision of this, the, this new apostle's responsibilities. They wanted him to go forth as a witness to the resurrection just as they had done. He, this, is, this is part of what apostle means after all. An apostle is an ambassador for the risen Lord to the places where God is a stranger, an alien. Peter does not expect that this man needed to be an eyewitness of the empty tomb as he was, but that he would become a witness to Christ's resurrection. So how do they go about filling this apostolic vacancy? Well, they did a survey of everyone in the church to see what they thought their their strengths and weaknesses were and what they hoped for in a new leader. Then they compiled those thoughts into a beautiful glossy brochure and mailed it out to prospective candidates. They asked for resumes and personal references from each interested party. They did a series of Zoom interviews and then brought the final three candidates in to face for face-to-face -face interviews. They graded each of them on their preaching style, their administrative acumen, and their pastoral presence with those in need. And it took two years, but finally they had someone for the church to vote on. No, that's not what they did. 
That's what we would do, right? <laughs> that's, that's what Presbyterians are known for. I was so grateful that at Covenant Presbyterian Church that the, the, uh, the uh, pastoral nominating committee was commissioned in October of 2019 and presented the new candidate in October of 2020. It took one year from the time they started to the time the new pastor, the Reverend Darcy Metcalf, was called. And so I could move on from there and at the end of December and come and be with you. Anyway, but that's not what they did. So actually, they already had two capable and qualified candidates who fit the criteria. Joseph Barsabbas, also called Justice, and Matthias. And, and it appears either one of these could have served equally well. And so they prayed, you, O oh God, know every one of us inside out. Make plain which of these two men you choose to take the place in this ministry and leadership that Judas threw away in order to go his own way. So they prayed, and then they did something that may sound pretty strange to us. They rolled the dice. They rolled the dice. Now, can you imagine that? Can you imagine if you were considering several candidates for the ministry, if your, if your pastoral nominating committee was considering several candidates and, and they, they got down to the final two and they rolled the dice to determine which one to present to you, that wouldn't go over very well, would it? But that's what they did. Now, the fact of the matter was the ancient Hebrews often determined God's will by a method known as casting lots. There are examples in the Old Testament in Judges and Joshua and in 1 Samuel and in Jonah. And, um, and while we may think that this was a strange way for them to choose a new leader, and I'm not sure I would recommend it to our nominating committee, no less an authority than John Calvin asks, was it not very irresponsible of the apostles and quite out of order to entrust such an important matter, matter to a lottery? A tough question, but tough questions asked in faith always deserve an answer. And so Calvin goes on to give the answer, no, the Holy Spirit was directing everything they did. And by everything, Calvin means not just the selection of Matthias, but also everything that happens in the book of Acts. And to prove the point, Calvin notes that the apostles used their reason they thoughtfully considered the choice and they narrowed down the field to the two best candidates. And then they acted in faith. They prayed and asked God for guidance. And then they rolled the dice and the lot fell on Matthias and he was added to the 11 apostles. And so Calvin believes that they were guided by the Holy Spirit throughout the process and Matthias, the replacement for Judas, was chosen by the providence of God. Matthias joins the 12, and then guess what happens? He completely vanishes from the New Testament. We never hear of him again, except in the writings of the ancient church historian Eusebius, who says Matthias was the apostle to Ethiopia. And that would appear to be the end of the story, except it's not. What is most striking about this story is that all the things Peter and the other apostles were looking for in a replacement for Judas are qualities which we, all of us, ought to be cultivating within ourselves. While being one of the apostles was obviously an important calling, and today being ordained as a pastor or as an elder or as a deacon is also an important calling, the reality is all Christians, by virtue of their baptism, are called to serve Christ in the world. The fact that we never hear of Matthias again in the New Testament points out that it wasn't necessary to have a spiritual superstar like Peter or John or James or Paul. What that first apostolic search committee was looking for was a faithful follower of Jesus who would continue to give witness to the resurrection. And that's what Jesus wants from all of us that we witness to the reality of God's presence in our lives and in our midst and in the world, that we follow the teachings and example of our Lord, that we as a church demonstrate to the world the kind of unity, love, and authentic faith which comes from walking closely with God. 
We are to be the kind of disciples who show our faith by doing the works that Jesus did. And here's the crucial point. This calling is not just for apostles. Or more to the point, apostleship isn't reserved just for 12 individuals who died 2,000 years ago. We are all called to be apostles, ambassadors, witnesses to our Lord. As God sent Jesus, so God sends you and me out into the world to love, to serve, to be blessed, and to be a blessing with everyone we meet. Well, so don't worry, you're not going to get a call from a member of the nominating committee saying, guess what, your number came up, you're going to serve the next three years on the session. But I do expect, as we continue this great adventure of serving together as pastor and people, that being united in one faith and devoting ourselves to prayer, we will open ourselves to new opportunities for joyful witness and faithful service in the name of Christ. So let us follow the example of one of the unsung heroes of our faith, Matthias, a faithful witness to the resurrection who was chosen through the providence of God by prayer and the roll of the dice. In the words of a poet, Matthias, patron saint of tailors, carpenters, alcoholics, and Gary, Indiana. Well, here's the day he gets chosen to replace Judas, the betrayer. And then there's no more about Matthias except mystery. Not all of us are the big names upon which you build your church. Some of us wonder if we're more Judas than not. And others feel like Matthias fading into the background. Even so, sew us together into one great peace, one holy, whole home for sinners and saints alike. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the example of Matthias. Though we know little about him, we know he was a faithful servant and witness to your resurrection. Help us to follow his example that we might be a church of salt and light to the community of Wilmington and beyond. In Christ's name, amen. I invite those who are able to rise as we affirm our faith in the Confession of Belhar, which was added to the Book of Confessions just, I think, three years ago. Let us say what we believe. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways, in that we love one another that we experience, practice, and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of benefit and blessing to one another, to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, Liz. Well, this week in my, in my scripture reading, I was reading 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, which uh, are where Paul calls on the uh, Christians in Corinth to follow the example of their brothers and sisters in Macedonia in giving to an offering to give relief to the people of Judea. And uh, he, he lifts up the example of the Macedonians, which I think is a, a marvelous thing. And he says that uh, uh, when we give generously and we give out of grateful hearts, then God showers blessings upon us. So I hope you are blessed to be here in your church. And I just want to remind you that as we give uh, generously to the support of our ministry together, then God's blessings are poured out on us in uh, not just materially, but physically, emotionally, spiritually, and in every way. So thank you for giving. The offering plate, as you know, is right by the the uh, back pew there. So uh, as we unite in prayer, I know our hearts are heavy about the situation in the Middle East, and uh, I invite you to be praying, especially for the Christians who live in Israel and Palestine who are caught in the midst of a very violent situation. Please join with me now in prayer. Center us now, O God, in your presence, in this place, among your people, as we lift up our heart's desires, our soul's deepest needs, our hungers, fears, and failures, as we have often failed to be obedient to your call in our lives as individuals and as a church, we pray that you will forgive us and you will empower us to be and to live the gospel of Christ. Help us to be more than hearers of the word, but also doers. Open us to your spirit's promptings and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in changing times and a hurting world. Hear our prayers for all those who suffer this day, the hungry and homeless, the sick and imprisoned, the angry, the lonely, and the lost. We pray that you would not let our concern pass from our hearts as these words pass through our lips, but rather that you would empower us to do your work of healing and reconciliation in the lives of people around us. We especially lift up to you this day all those close to our hearts and this community of faith. The psalmist told us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So today we pray for all the residents of that city that is sacred to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Today our hearts break for the, all the victims of violence in Israel and Palestine, for Jewish people who've endured violent attacks from Palestinians who live in fear, and for those who relive the trauma of the Holocaust over and over. We pray for the Palestinian people who've endured decades of occupation and oppression, and those who are refugees long displaced from their homes. We pray for the Arab citizens of Israel who are treated as second-class citizens. And we lift to you the 40,000 Christians who live in the West Bank and Gaza, asking that they might maintain a peaceful witness in the midst of violent chaos. For all your children in that region, let hatred be turned into love, fear to trust, despair to hope, oppression to freedom, occupation to liberation, that violent encounters may re be replaced with loving embraces and peace and justice be experienced by all. As you made a fearful and disjointed band of disciples into your holy church, we pray that you would make us anew, that we, your body and our world, would serve you in joy and hope and thankfulness all the days of our life together in Jesus Christ, our risen and ascended Lord, in whose glorious name we pray, and who invites us to pray the words he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 439, In Christ There Is No East or West. Please stand as you are able. <laughs>